Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. Welcome to today's podcast. I am Daisy Cunningham. I am the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Heritage Manager. And hello, my name is Laura Burgess and I volunteer with Daisy at the Royal College of Physicians at Edinburgh's Heritage Team. Um, And we are, as always, moving around the body and today we are looking at the skull. Um, So I've been doing a bit of reading around this and I'll be interested to hear what Laura thinks (laughs) By the way, a lot of this is going to be related to medical cannibalism because I got very, very overexcited by the concept of, of medical cannibalism. If I say medical cannibalism to you, what do you think that sounds like? I feel like it was like, in my head, I, I think of cannibalism as an act of eating another human being. But no, medical cannibalism, I have absolutely no idea. I'm just envisioning a big table with lots of doctors around and then they open like a dish, it's just a head, and then they eat it. <laughs> That's all I can think of weirdly at the moment. Not quite that exciting. No, no. Um, medical cannibalism, as it's usually defined, can be pretty much any body part or also things that come out of the body. So there's quite a lot of urine. There's quite a lot of menstrual blood, breast milk, but also body parts. So a lot of human fat, various different human organs. But a big part of it is skulls, which is, of course, kind of why it fits in with this episode. But one of the things that I find very fascinating about medical cannibalism, which is a huge thing from the sort of 1100s right up to the Victorian period, which is when it starts fizzling out. There's this layer of basically racism, you would call it, where, you know, cannibalism in other cultures is hugely looked down on, is hugely viewed as uncivilized, you know, Mm -hmm. in this kind of era of colonialism. But somehow the cannibalism that we're doing here in Britain is refined, is dignified, is acceptable, is completely different. And I think a lot of it has to do with the preparation. So like you were saying, Laura, you know, this idea of you lift up, a, you know, the top of a dish and there's a head. It wasn't like that. It was things were usually crushed. They were processed. They were made into a powder or a tonic. You would buy them in a jar and you would rub them on the skin or take them. And somehow that process of mixing up the body part made it civilised, apparently. Wait, so people genuinely put human body parts on their face in their hair, in their bodies, for medicinal purposes. Absolutely. And if you're looking at either a printed recipe book or pharmacopoeia or a handwritten recipe book from, say, 1500s, 1600s and, you know, 1700s as well, it would be very rare to go through an entire volume and not find at least one example of medical cannibalism in there. So it was it was very standard and it was done in England and Scotland. It was done in France and Germany. You know, it, it was it was widespread and it was very normal. A lot of it is l- what what was sort of seen as kind of like for like medicine, which was quite normal mm-hmm. in the early modern period. For example, the skull was particularly associated with epilepsy, with hysteria, with mm-hmm. other diseases that were associated with the head or with the mind. The skull was the right medicine for that. So it, it would, yeah, it would depend on what your disease was as to what body part you would be using to treat it. So people would eat crushed up skull to help their epilepsy i mean that was very much the idea yeah so i'm trying to still trying to get my head around this that's fascinating i never even thought that that was i i mean how did they procure them was it just from cadavers or well this is when it gets a little bit bleak um (laughs) as if we weren't a little bit bleak to start off with but we're getting a little (laughs) bit bleak now there was an idea that especially with the skull as opposed to other body parts that the sort of diseases that we were talking about were violent diseases. So Mm -hmm. epilepsy, hysteria, they were they were associated with fits. Um, And so you wanted a skull of somebody who had died a violent death. So sometimes it would be people who had been executed. But what was far more common, and there was a huge trade in this, was skulls from Ireland, from the Irish wars. 
Because what you also ideally wanted was skulls that had not been buried. Because as well as the skull itself, there's a whole branch of medicine around the moss that has grown on the skull, which would only grow if a body had decomposed above ground. And so this was such a big industry that England was actually kind of the the European leaders in this, by which I mean they didn't only take these skulls to use within England, they also then sold them on the continent. So they were selling the bodies of the people that they had killed Killed. and using that as as a money making resource. And it was so common that there were actually import and export duties levied specifically on the skulls of Irish people when they were sold by the English. Oh my God. Was there any kind of pushback from the Irish or from anyone? Because I'm assuming they were they were aware of it. I mean... I mean, I think, I mean, there were certainly opinions had, but, you know, a lot of it's about power and where the power lies. And I don't think mm-hmm. they were in a position to do anything about it at that point, unfortunately. But there was also recipes involving skulls that were used in the remote highlands and islands of Scotland. And as far as we know, you know, they were sourcing those locally. You know, this was sort of a part of folk culture in rural areas which wasn't connected with this wider industry necessarily and i think that's part of what to me is interesting about the the medical cannibalism and and the use of skulls is that it crosses every sort of divide you know it's the very wealthiest people in society are doing this but also the very poorest people as well so you know king charles ii himself he didn't create but he acquired a recipe that he then claimed as his own which had human skull and alcohol on it which was called the king's drops which became very very popular treatment particularly for epilepsy But then, as I say, you know, in very rural, very sort of impoverished communities, a lot of medical recipes tend to revolve around things that you don't need to buy. So when Mm -hmm. you read these sort of Highlands and Islands recipes, a lot of it involves things like thistles and nettles and salt water from the sea and aspects of medical cannibalism because... You know, they don't have access to apothecary shops and imported ingredients like Peruvian bark. Sorry, I'm just so, I'm, I, this has really taken me by surprise. This I didn't really know we'll go to cannibalism immediately. And I'm enjoying it. This is fascinating. I um, mean, what, what also is, to me is fascinating, and, and this often applies to a lot of history of medicine, but is how long it survives for. You know, you hear about something like medical cannibalism and you expected it to be in medieval Europe. Mm. And then you start reading texts where it's, you know, it's the early 1800s and they're still talking about these ingredients. So what drove them or what kind of, made them stop using it by the 1800s if it had been serving them so well previously. I find it certainly fascinating when you get into that period of the late 1700s and into the 1800s where there's there's at least somewhat of a realisation that ideas that have existed since the time of ancient Greece. So we're talking about medical cannibalism, but we're also talking about, you know, like for like ideas that we just Mm. mentioned, humoral theory, you know, the idea of balancing humours in the body, all these things people are starting to realise just don't really make sense and don't really work. But they haven't quite got to a point where laboratory science is good enough. So that's when medical cannibalism starts fading out they're trying to develop you know science but they don't really know what they're doing so they're sort of having a go at lots of different things so this Mm. sort of period late 1700s and into the 1800s this is when homeopathy appears this is when uh, lots of different sort of testing grounds for for new aspects of, of this sort of science in inverted commas and that leads on nicely to something else that i wanted to talk about which is phrenology Mmm, oh. phrenology, my favourite. <laughs> I was hosting new ideas, <laughs> trying to, to find something, trying to apply scientific principles, but not really getting there, I think would probably safely apply to phrenology. So you're, I was going to say a fan, that's definitely not the right way of putting it, but no, you're obviously I'm interested. <laughs> interested, aware of it as a attempt by a lot of physicians to develop into something like a specialism I mean as someone who's very interested in psychiatry phrenology kind of appeared at this very interesting point where they were trying to explain people's behaviors and wanting obviously to use something as a marker 
to just kind of highlight like if someone has a protruding forehead then that means they're prone to violence or if someone has i don't know divots in the back of their skull um it means you know they might be weak-minded i don't i also have seen a lot of the phrenology um the heads you know the the ceramic heads which i find aesthetically very fun to look at but the actual science, and again, I'm going to put my quotes up here, from my understanding, was very steeped in uh, racism and uh, colonialism. And this idea, again, as, as someone who's very interested in criminal lunacy and, um, and criminal behaviour and psychiatry, um, this idea that they wanted to be like, oh, this protruding brow or this large nose or these his the, the angle of his eyebrows means that he is prone to criminal behaviour. Even at the time when phrenology was on the rise, there were a fair number of of doctors and scientists out there who, who were sort of saying, "I don't, I don't really. I think you're just reckoning a thing." It's almost like equ- scientifically equivalent to you know spiritualism, to to mm-hmm. you know seeing ghosts. It's it's that sort of level, and that's in some senses how it was treated. You know, in the Victorian period there was a lot of exciting performance of phrenology. So you might go to a tarot card reader, you might also go to a phrenologist, you know, you might get a group of you who would go and they would tell you what your husband was going to be like and how you should meet the perfect man. It it was it was sort of a, a, a hobby as much as it was a science, but I can I can see the logic of why people sort of wanted to attach themselves to phrenology because it feels like for a lot of the 1800s that most branches of medicine are becoming increasingly specialized. You have all of these sort of scientific developments that mean various branches of medicine are now understandable in a way they weren't before. And the brain and the mind, and by extension, the skull, are still a problem. They are still very difficult to know. They are difficult to quantify. And so you end up with the branch of psychiatry appearing to a lot of people to be a lot more wishy-washy than, mm-hmm. say, dermatology is. You know, these these seemingly more rigorous branches. So they're trying to come up with a scientific process equivalent to the scientific processes of other branches. But it's tricky. It, the, the mind is incredibly tricky. And so, you know, they try, many people try and settle on phrenology, but it is, um, well, as we started off, it is very much a pseudoscience. Mm. Um, also, while we were, while we were on this, um, I have here in my home. A phrenology! Uh, a phrenology bus. It's a modern replica of a historical one because mm. I don't have the money to buy them. But looking, but it is a, a, a genuine replica of a phrenology bus by Ellen Fowler. And so he was he was a very prominent in this field. And just so just going to read out some of the areas of the brain. I'd love to so, learn. So uh, front right is moral and religious sentiment. <laughs> just Laura's just checking that part of it. I had to go left and right to make sure which one was sentiment. Just over your right ear is selfishness. Uh, back right is domesticity. And next to that is dignity and self-love. I'd be interested to know why they applied those sort of quote-unquote behaviours or inclinations to different parts of the skull. Well, it shows you what their preoccupations were, absolutely. And it's so, it feels so Victorian. So gendered. Coming up with a list either 100 years later or 100 years earlier, it would not have been this list. So Mm. it shows you their level of sort of um, uh, biases. So... We have parental love, next to it, love of children, and next to that, love of animals. Uh, Patriotism is a part of the brain. Patriotism is is in there. Dignity, stability, benevolence, uh, human nature. I don't know what human nature is, if it's all of the other things that we've already covered. But (laughs) Yeah, there is a lot of vagueness going on here, which I think might have been on purpose. Neatness. Neatness, being tidy, uh, calculation, desire for liquids. <laughs> just those are people that just want to be super hydrated all of the time. <laughs> yeah, and that's part of your brain, and that's just next to the left ear. So you know, yeah, it's 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 it feels so specific to a particular era that you know, as you were saying, religious sentiments, patriotism, you know, love of animals. The, these are parts of a human brain, apparently according to the principles of phrenology. In our case study today, we're going to look at trepanation. 
trepanation involves drilling a hole in the skull. This process of skull drilling has been done at various points and places in history, going right back to Neolithic times, over 7,000 years ago. But there isn't one singular reason why it was carried out. This process has been believed to serve a whole range of different purposes. Trepanation is referenced in ancient Greek texts. Indeed, it is recommended there for almost any type of head injury, even pretty minor ones. Trepanation was seen as necessary because a wound could result in blood becoming stuck or immobile, and non-moving blood could go bad and become toxic to the body. So the removal of excess blood or bad blood was necessary for health. It was believed that a wound should bleed naturally, and if it didn't bleed, it was unnatural and a potentially poisonous wound. Trepanation just fixed this aberration. But by the time of the Greek physician Galen, around 200 AD, the understanding of the purpose of trepanation had developed. It was believed to relieve pressure on the skull and to allow for the removal of any skull fragments that could enter the brain. It was used to treat a range of complaints, including headaches, epilepsy, mental illness and blindness. Any condition that was thought to have been caused directly or indirectly by a problem with the brain or the skull was believed to be treatable by this approach. When an Italian surgeon, Rogerius, studied the use of trepanation in the 12th century, he found, quote, For mania or melancholy, an incision is made in the top of the head, and the cranium is opened to permit the noxious material to exhale to the outside. The patient is held in chains and the wound is treated. But it was an extremely risky procedure, and so there continued to be a lot of debate about how useful it actually was. This only increased in the 1700s and 1800s, when the site of operations shifted from the home to hospitals. Mortality rates due to infection became so high that the risks from trepanation outweighed any potential benefits. There are quite a few differences, unsurprisingly, between the historic practice of trepanation and modern-day craniotomies, but one particularly significant one is that when a craniotomy is carried out, whether to access an aneurysm or remove a tumour or relieve intracranial pressure, a part of the process is to replace the part of the skull which has been removed as quickly as possible. Trepanation, by contrast, left the patient permanently missing a piece of their skull. In this short excerpt, Professor Sue Black talks about the origins of the discipline or specialty of forensic anthropology. If you go back and you look at where the physical anthropologists really were working, we can go back as far in time as you like in terms of the definition of what is a physical anthropologist. We can make Galen into a physical anthropologist if we so choose, because the definition is fundamentally so broad. And it is about the study of the human and the way in which the human presents, not necessarily just physically, which is the physical side, but the other side of anthropology that might be cultural anthropology, linguistic anthropology, religious anthropology, so many anthropologies you couldn't shake a stick at them. And it means that these boundaries do become just a little bit blurred. But we have an incredible pedigree when it comes to physical anthropology, this identification of the human, which is so very firmly embedded not surprisingly within the anatomy laboratories, because that's where we understand what the human looks like outside and inside, how it varies from one person to another. And if we understand how it varies from one person to another, what the incidence of those variations are, then we start to get to a point of a discrimination, a potential identification of an individual, and then a statistical probability. So it isn't a great leap, if you like, to go from the early dissecting rooms into the sort of modern field of forensic anthropology. There is a very, very logical way in which it can progress. Certainly, when we look at where we have that crossover occurring into something that we would for the first time be happy to recognize as forensic anthropology. That says taking those variations, those things about the human that we know, and taking them into the courtroom relies us on, on us having good records, if you like, from the courtroom that says that somebody came in and talked about this thing. We didn't call it forensic anthropology at the time, but there was no doubt that probably the first 
really identifiable court case that used the experience and expertise of an anatomist in the courtroom for the purposes of identity occurred with a Harvard anatomist. And it was occurring around the, the late 1800s. When forensic anthropology as a discipline came into the UK, and by that I mean a discipline that was recognised because it was going on, we were helping the police with their investigations, as they would say, but not being recognised as a named discipline. So when the first um, training course came into the UK in terms of forensic anthropology, not surprisingly, it was in an anatomy department, an anatomy department associated with a medical school. But it's in a very much later time period, 1987, before we really have forensic anthropology in the UK starting to define itself as a discipline. So, you know, if we were to look at this in terms of the history of man, we're barely in the neonatal ward at this stage. It's very, very early stages within the UK. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. Skulls appear in medical recipe books as both a body part to be treated and as a key ingredient for treatments. This is because human skulls were an ingredient in a form of treatment known as medical cannibalism. Medical cannibalism, also known as corpse medicine, crossed social boundaries. For hundreds of years, right up to the early 1800s, corpse medicine treatments could be found in printed and handwritten recipe books and was used as much by aristocrats and royalty as it was by the poor. Medical cannibalism refers to the use of human material in treatments. The blood, urine, fat and bones were listed as simples, the building blocks of treatments, in the 1748 edition of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Pharmacopoeia. This pharmacopoeia was supposed to standardise medical preparations, and it acted as a guide for physicians. So these human ingredients were not merely a suggestion, or a form of folk or unorthodox healing, but formally codified into medicine. All of these ingredients are now considered distasteful for many reasons, but at the time there was a scale of more or less effective cannibalism. When it came to skulls, those of executed criminals were believed to have particularly significant power. Powdered skull was particularly popular as a treatment for epilepsy and other diseases of the head. According to one book from our college's collections, John Moncrief's Poor Man's Physician, quote, Powder of a man's bones burnt of the skull, given, cureth the epilepsy. The bones of a man cureth a man, the bones of a woman cureth the woman. Not only were skulls themselves used as ingredients, but the moss that grew on them also appears in early treatments. Similarly to the powdered skull, this was believed to be more powerful when the person had died a violent or untimely death. Skull moss was most often used against nosebleeds or other sorts of blood loss such as battle wounds. Sometimes it was placed on the wound and sometimes it was mixed with wine or another liquid and drunk. One book from our college's collections, titled The Book of Physic and dated 1599, gives a recipe for its use as, quote, Take the moss off a dead man's cranium or skull, tie it in a little thin cloth, and apply that to the patient his nose, and it helpeth. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe. Dot ac dot uk forward slash heritage you can also find us on twitter at rcpe heritage and we have a just giving page rcpe heritage linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts thank you